Hello, and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. Today, I'm honored to have Kevin Johnston with me. Kevin is the owner and founder of Enchant. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, soon you will probably have Enchant coming to your city. And otherwise, you can at least check them out on Instagram. And there's some YouTube videos highlighting it. But it's a pretty phenomenal winter display. And so I can't wait to uh, break that down with Kevin, but Kevin's going to highlight a lot of his pivotal moments and how he's gotten to where he's at today. So Kevin, thanks so much for being on. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So Kevin, uh, let's kick it off into some younger years. So growing up in Canada, and at some point you decide, you know what, I, I know people like to have lights uh, on their homes for holidays, maybe I could be doing that. So talk a little bit about getting started in that, uh, that industry. Yeah. yeah, I mean, post high school, I didn't really know what I was to do. And, um, and so my best friend and I, we literally two weeks before Christmas, just decided to go knock on some doors and see if we could ask people to put up their lights. And um, I think I spent the whole eight hours just knocking on doors and walked away with about a dozen jobs. And we were just kind of surprised by that. We're like, hey, let's let's take this seriously next year. And uh, I think the following year, we um, boarded my dad's truck, put a magnet on it. And uh, before you knew it, we had a little business going. I love that. So I've got to know, is there any entrepreneurial past in your family where parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles entrepreneurial or is this just something kind of out of the whim for you um yeah my dad's an entrepreneur so okay. it's um yeah they had zero pressure on me to do any kind of post-education in fact I barely finished high school so um and they were very uh, gracious and supportive in that process if I ever wanted to get picked up from school they would come grab me and uh um and even back in high school, I was actually building websites for small businesses. And um, so I had, yeah, just always selling golf balls when I was a kid. Um, I was always doing something. And uh, so when Christmas lights rolled around, it just, yeah, it was an obvious thing for us to run with and <laughs> it worked out. Yeah. So one thing I, I, I'm curious about is, you know, as you have entrepreneurial parents, uh, your dad uh, doing that, were there certain things about his lifestyle or what that was able to provide you that you're like, Ooh, this is attractive to me, or maybe certain things about, uh, thinking if I didn't have that, that would be unattractive to me if I had to go work for somebody. Yeah, uh, honestly, it was, it's just so ingrained in me. Like I never even thought about getting a job somewhere like it. Um, it was always about starting something and, um, just figuring out a way to make money at the time. And, um, and like even my dad like he he's done some pretty unique stuff in his career um but it wasn't all roses and and beautiful so um <laughs> yeah he did but at the same time i just i saw him work hard and i saw him have a goal and work towards it and so that just became my normal absolutely so getting back to the story, we're 19, we've knocked on some doors, we got 12 yeses, uh, we're going to start hanging Christmas lights. Now, I think for a lot of people starting a business, one of the things that they can run into is, well, I didn't have the perfect business plan, so I just didn't even get started. So talk a little bit about, you know, yes, there's something to be said about <laughs> having a plan, having a strategy, but there's also something to be said about just get started, right? The, the rest of it can be figured out, but just get started. So talk a little bit about that for you. Yeah, like I would say my strong suits are more on the creative um, side of things. So like business administration is definitely not my strong suit. <laughs> um, and so it was all about just getting the name right, getting the branding looking good. Um, and, and then uh, I don't know where it came from, but I just always had a passion for doing a good job. And, um, and so like working with clients, opp having opportunity to do design with them, like we wouldn't, um, we wanted everything to be white lights just cause it looks in my opinion, the best. And so yeah. like, we wouldn't even offer to do multicolor lights for anyone. It was always like, keeping things clean and, and nice looking. And, um, and that drew us a reputation in the, in the, in Vancouver at the time. Um, so we ended up doing like the nicest houses in town because the owners wanted a very particular job done and they knew that uh, my best friend Cam and I at the time were doing that. Um, like we were offering a premium service. So, um, 
we like even our flyers it looked like a couple uh, realtors were going to come do your lights for you we were <laughs> in suits smiling and uh, <laughs> i love that so year one uh, you kind of hinted that earlier. Year one goes well enough that you decide, you know what, year two, we, we need even more assistance. So we got a truck, borrowed a truck. Um, so with that, what was it about year two that allowed you to do more? Was there a marketing campaign? Uh, was it just word of mouth? How did you guys grow? Yeah, so in year one, we actually borrowed um, $15,000 from um, my uh, Cam's uncle. And uh at the time that was like a huge amount of money. We've never yeah. seen that much money before. And we were looking at each other, like, how are we ever going to pay that back? And, um, but that gave us what we needed to print out flyers and, um, buy some inventory, buy a ladder. And, uh, it kind of got us on our feet. Um, and we actually did pretty well that year. I think we grossed like 86 grand or something. And, um, to us, that was just unbelievable. And, um, and it was just a really fun start to this. And we're like, okay, let's keep going. And um, it was really just word of mouth that grew the business. Like we were, um, like we just did a good job from day one and yeah. got referrals and just kept on moving. And within a few years, we ended up doing like the who's who of Vancouver business and all the nice homes. Um, and then ended up getting a lot of the malls in the city. Um, even in the very first year, we actually dropped a business card off at the nicest mall in the city. and. Um, they're like, oh, we've already have a contract for this year, but they sent our business card out to a sister uh, property out in the valley, and we ended up getting that contract, and that was our biggest contract by a margin. Um, and so it was, and that was actually something where they wanted a particular product um, that was this really fancy French company, yeah. and um, the price on it was insane. It was like eight hundred dollars for five lights, and um, we ended up looking online and found a a knockoff version and um and so they were super happy they were saving tons of money and we still had a huge markup on it that i was almost embarrassed about how big it was and uh, but it was a win-win for both groups and the lights look great and um and so that was really our, our first big win uh selling that product yeah so as you talk about that and working with some of the who's who you know in the area was the the business growth in regards to that was that then the demographic all right hey this is who we can help the most and then also into the commercial building so talk a little bit about being able to help in that segment and what that meant for your business and the growth of it and so we want to work with clients who expect that and um so our, our marketing naturally went in a very premium direction. Um, the service that we offered was premium and, and also you can allow your pricing to be premium as well. And, yeah. um, and so that's it just really worked for everyone. And um, they wanted to know that two guys were gonna come in and do a quality job. And, and if anything went wrong, we'd, they'd call us and we'd be right back. And um, so just offering a really high level service. And, um, and yeah, it's like, you look after the guest, they look after you. It's the same mentality now that we're doing events, like, um, and, but it's just gone from client to guest. I love it. Now with that, you know, I think something that's important to, you know, highlight and remember is that as you're scaling your business, right, you, you come to that kind of threshold where you realize, well, maybe we're not for everybody, right? Uh, we, we could do every type of house, but that might cause us to slack in this area. And I think for a lot of people, you start a business and you try and market to everyone. And if you're not careful, you, you can quickly find yourself being spread too thin. Whereas if you start realizing, all right, this is where we want to be working, that can be helpful to the growth uh, of your business, like you guys kind of figured out. Yeah. Yeah. There was definitely a few clients there that we shouldn't have taken in the early <laughs> days and you end up spending all day on one tree and, and it's just a waste of everyone's time. Yeah. Um, but finding those right clients who um, appreciate what you're doing, appreciate the service you're offering and, um, and are, are willing to pay for it. I love it. So 
as you're growing and you are, you know, yes, in commercial properties, you're doing the big, big names, who's who's in Vancouver, uh, you guys get a neat opportunity within the city. So talk about how that came to be and what it turned into. Yeah. So the business, uh, my best friend had left the business after a couple of years. He actually went into real estate and, um, I remember clearly he went to real estate and I went to China and um, had this opportunity to start making our own lights from scratch. And we created a, a, a West Coast proof light, we called it. So one that could withstand the Vancouver rain. And, wow. um, and so we had done that for five years. The business had grown um, to a pretty healthy point for a, a solo guy. And, um, and I think it was uh, Christmas of 2014 I remember having a conversation with that same guy's Cam's wife. Um, and I don't know how the impetus was, but just the words light and maze were said in that conversation. And uh, I just remember it just kind of clicked in my head and I just started thinking about it a lot. And um, I actually rented some construction fence panels to my parents' backyard and threw lights up on it and was kind of envisioning what a field of this would look like. Yeah. And, um, and I still have a photo actually from from that day and uh um and then i i just drew a maze like more of a complicated get lost type of experience yeah and i built a little uh presentation deck around it and i pitched it to the city of vancouver um and they said hey we're going to treat you like a building because you need a building permit and you everybody has to be within 15 meters of an egress and um as soon as i heard that i was like well there goes that idea like there's like, that's not good. I can't build a maze under that rule. Um, and, but after going home and just like thinking about it, like, how do we make this work? Um, it was in that process that the thought of turning it into a scavenger hunt and writing a story and turning it into more of an aesthetic adventure. Um, it all kind of came to be. And suddenly I was like, like drawing a, this other version of a maze that's like a little more open and could follow the building permit rules um and before you knew it we were like i was like hiring random 3d designers online to design trees and um, reindeer and like everything that we would need my wife ended up writing the story um and but it was very much like get started without knowing all the details and yeah. um and it's like we didn't even have the name picked out for like well into 2016 when we ended up launching at the end of 2016 um and uh but i think during that naming process we like looked up every name for <laughs> anything to do with christmas <laughs> and winter and um every language you could think of and yeah. uh we've one night we just finally landed on enchant and uh it just felt right seemed right and uh um and just went from there so I, I've got a plethora of questions, but one that <laughs> just comes instantly to my mind is why take the risk, right? So, you know, business is going well. This is a whole kind of out there idea that no one else is doing. Why take the business risk? So talk about that, Kevin, for you. Why was it worth the risk? Um, I think at the time, uh, like every year we had a new product. Um, yeah. It was something that we could talk about in our marketing. It was something exciting. Like we had the west coast proof lights and then we made our own roof line light that was a lot cleaner than the old cone style um then we had these wicker balls that were super popular and um, i remember a year went by and i just like another idea didn't pop up and i was just frustrated i was like we need more ideas and um and so i think when the light maze thing came along it was like like i never run an event before i had no idea really what it could turn into um but it just it was a new idea and it just felt just felt right and i just had to figure it out and um and i remember like we'd we'd make a little bit of money every year and but i would just pour everything back into the business and um i remember we just, like wrote this whole business plan for this event and um out there trying to raise some money to get it off the ground and um and this is into 2016 um like i think i was like, spending like our last 50 grand towards like making this thing happen yeah. and got down to basically no money left and having to press order on, on these lights, um, to make the show happen. Um, and it was like within days we found the right investor and like leading up to that, we were talking to multiple different groups. Each of them were, would have made the deal completely different. 
Um, so it was like a super like just stressful time figuring out who she go with and um, meanwhile pushing it all forward as if it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> so there's there's been a lot of leaps of faith in in my journey and um, and even even prior to Enchant, like I would like it was different size numbers, but it was the same stress of like I have to order lights and I don't know how much inventory to order. And the contracts never got firmed up until like October, November. And we would have to order six figures worth of lights and, and just pray that the jobs came in. And, um, and like every year we'd have to find a different source for that money. Um, I remember even one day or one year, my dad ended up loaning me some money and like I was taking mortgage on his house. So wow. like just super, super supportive. And, yeah. um, but every year it worked really well. And, uh, but it, and then, but then the next year was bigger and then the next year was bigger and then Enchant just took it to a whole new scale. So as you're saying that, I, I want to highlight this and just hear from your experience. How has the support of people in your life, whether it was parents, uh, you know, you mentioned your wife helped write, so I'm sure she's supporting you, uh, but talk about the support or having support from the people closest to you and what, what that's meant for you and how that's helped you and as your business has grown. Oh yeah. Like there's quite a few people in my life that if they weren't here in chat wouldn't be either. Yeah. And um, so it's, yeah, like I may be the founder, but there's like, don't give me all the credit. Like there's a <laughs> lot of people who help make Enchant happen. Um, like even the relationships that we built overseas for manufacturing, um, like that was like, we've been using the same group for like 13 years now. Wow. And like the things that they've been able to pull off on the not great timelines that I've given them is like truly heroic. Um, and uh, I think within a couple of years of the original business, um, I did find an administrator um, uh, named Cindy, and she really made an unbelievable difference as well. Um, and because like I said, I was not the administrator of a lot of this. Like she would have to sit me down to actually write the invoices and because uh, we'd get through the whole Christmas season and I hadn't invoiced anybody yet. So, um, <laughs> so she's, yeah, she was remarkable and, and she helped uh, considerably in the early enchant days too. Um, I think we ended up probably hiring about 10 people to replace her one function. <laughs> wow. Now, the other thing I want to know, kind of once again, you know, tying into the who knew in the moment type of a moment, um, getting in front of a city board is no easy task. Uh, what were some of the connections or things that led to you getting the opportunity to pitch this idea uh, to the city of Vancouver? Yeah, it was um, a lot of a lot of cold calls and uh, just banging on doors. Um, the property that we ended up getting was unbelievable. Like it was right downtown Vancouver. Um, couldn't have been a better spot, really. And uh, but we were told no um, when I first reached out about it, and um, and I just kept on calling different departments within the city, trying to get different people on the line, and um, and at the time, like. I didn't have any photos and no one knew what it, the light maze was. Right, um, right. Like, I didn't even know what it was to a certain degree. And, uh, um, but we finally found this right person and they're like, Oh yeah, I think that could be available. And, um, it just, yeah, it just worked out. We got a good deal on it too. And, um, and yeah, so it's, yeah, there wasn't, I didn't have any contacts prior. It was just banging on doors. Yes. So, as that first event comes to fruition, talk a little bit about how it went and some of the results from it. Yeah, so I mean, looking back on it, and by the end of it, you could say it went extremely well. Yeah. Um, but opening weekend was, I couldn't have said that. <laughs> um, yeah, even getting the show done on time, um, like, like that part mostly happened. Um, I think the front gate wasn't actually installed by the time we opened up on opening day, but the guest doesn't know what the guest doesn't know. Hey, absolutely and, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we had a lot of issues on, on the permitting side, um, and of drainage. Um, yeah. so never having done the event before, uh, we made a lot of decisions that, uh, in retrospect, weren't great decisions. Um, the biggest one being that we thought it was a great idea to lay bark, uh, bark mulch down over the entire site 
like it smelled good it looked nice it, we could hide the cables and the the bases for the sculptures so yeah. on like the week of sunny weather that we laid it down on it we thought it was a <laughs> fantastic um and then like uh on opening like leading into opening weekend it started pouring rain and the whole place just soaked it up and it just turned into this massive uh swamp and yeah. um and so i think it was the midnight of opening night we had a bunch of bobcats in there picking up material laying down gravel instead and um actually we had the police come and complain or someone called us and always complained in because we had these bobcats running so super late at night and I, <laughs> I just i do end up to the police officer and i was just like i literally have no choice like i'm so sorry but i have <laughs> to keep going and we'll be done as quick as we can <laughs> and she was just really gracious with us and it's like okay keep it make it quick and uh and you could just hear the beeping of the bobcats and yeah. <laughs> all the apartments nearby just see everyone glaring at me and uh um but we ended up opening um we actually had a situation with the uh permit um the inspector who uh, he told us um like we had sold like 30,000 tickets for opening weekend it was like unbelievable yeah. and um he came on a thursday and just gave us this laundry list of stuff that he wanted changed and he just didn't like us from the second he he met me i don't know why um and he uh it was the kind of list for like you'll never get this done and, right yeah um and so we just put our head down got through all of it and he said he would come back on monday and i was like no like we're opening tomorrow like we have to be open we sold this many tickets um and i actually had to call um his boss just to make him come and wow. um and he said he, he knew we opened at four he's like i'll come at four fifteen and just to like give us one little right more. <laughs> and uh i couldn't even be in that meeting because i would not have gone well and uh so our our build lead uh, took the meeting and we ended up and i was actually with the crowd handing out candy canes and stuff trying to we had this line that went from the front gate like multiple blocks away wow. and everyone's like like asking why we're not opening yet and uh i just keep giving out candy canes <laughs> trying to make people happy um and then I think 45 minutes late, he finally gave us the green light and we opened it up and, and chat was live. So, um, yeah, it was it was a crazy weekend. I think Saturday, Sunday, it ended up just raining. And I remember calling in a group of friends and like, the whole maze was just one big puddle, basically. Yeah. And uh, we were having to put um, crate or uh, pallets down um, <laughs> over these over the ponds and like creating like bridges for people. And uh, so it was just not a great opening weekend. And I actually had to do a little public service announcement on the Monday, uh, just apologizing and uh, for all the ruined shoes that I caused. <laughs> um, and uh, we ended up calling like every drainage company in the phone book to come in and we had literally carved up the maze, put down gravel and pipes and um and got the maze draining and the site itself actually just didn't have drainage yeah and i just didn't think to ask that before right. <laughs> going into it and um so it all ended up working out in the end and uh every weekend it would get significantly better and um, we ended up hosting 230,000 people that year it was just like a huge success and um and that um and that was the impetus of them calling me into the uh, they called me into a boardroom after the session after yeah. the events and um the the traffic engineer spoke up first and um he was like he said hey i gotta admit when that light maze came across my desk i had no idea what it was and i asked around the office people were like yeah it's a light maze and he's like okay and he just gave us the stamp of approval and um but they said they never would have approved it if they had known how big it was and um because we literally just clogged up that corner of the city for a month yeah. and um <laughs> yeah so well so so talk about that right so the first one goes off i mean don't get me wrong i'd love to say that was super smooth but there were plenty of things that were roadblocks yeah. and then post that they say you're not doing this again yeah. But here we are in 2021 doing uh, these events at different locations. So talk about what transpired past that and what your vision was after that first event. 
Yeah, I mean, after we did the first one, then it was like, okay, this is real. It's no longer a proof of concept. Yeah. Um, and like we had real numbers, we had real budgets, we had actuals on everything. And, um, and we definitely wanted to do it again and just continue to improve upon it. Um, and we looked, the city was, even though they told us we couldn't do it, like they were still very friendly. Like they're like, we love your show. We want to see it happen in the city somewhere, but we just literally can't think of anywhere that's big enough to host it. And so I did look in other parts of the city and nothing was standing out to me. Um, and that was in January. And like already Christmas is coming for me. Like it's yeah, right. We, we got to find something quick. And so I just thought about, um, I wanted to get out of the rain because that was our number one issue. <laughs> and uh, um, so I thought about the Southern US and thought about uh, baseball not being in season. And I literally just Google mapping tons of stadium uh, properties all over the US and I just stumbled across the one in Dallas and saw a big flat parking lot. And I'd never even been to Dallas before, but I, I called the Rangers and asked if I could rent lot F and, um, and uh, the investors that I had at the time, um, they were some lenders. Um, They're like, there's no way you're going to get visas and it's just too far away. It's too far fetched for us. Like we, we can't do it. Um, So I was like literally left that meeting and on the, on the drive home, picked up the phone and called the first guy I could think of who was a Christmas light client. Um, and just he thankfully he picked up i drove straight to his house i was like here's my situation like we've got this business it did this and uh, we want to move it down um to the u.s and um and he basically just put his hand across the table and said let's give it a shot and um and so i was lucky to find him quickly and um and and then it was a process of figuring out work permits and we had to get e2 visas to go into the us and um negotiating with the rangers and finding new production people down in texas and um yeah it was honestly like looking back on it is totally crazy um and uh like we didn't do all the mark like we did some market research like we knew it was three times bigger than vancouver and yeah. um and the dallas cowboys are there the rangers are there figured it's a pretty good location um, and, uh, yeah, we, so we just went for it and, uh, we made the show a whole lot bigger that year too. Um, like our first show was only about 11 containers and yeah. our second one was in that 40 to, I guess, 50 actually on the high yeah, side. 50, yeah. And, uh, um, so yeah, it was, yeah, that was a pretty stressful time in my life, to be honest. Like I think during the install, like I could only eat white bread, like it was and like sip water, like it was like. <laughs> quite stressful <laughs> yes um, but we got the show open on time and uh hosted another two hundred fifty thousand people that year and um and it was a it was a really cool show actually we had an, that was the first time having a skating trail we put a bridge over the middle of it and it just had a really cool village there um it was just probably the one of the most scenic shows that we've created so far and um and uh, yeah it was just so it ended up going really well. Um, and then that's when we got a phone call from the Seattle Mariners. Um, and they're like, hey, we heard what you're doing with the Rangers. Um, we don't have a uh, parking lot, but we have a stadium. And would you consider using that? Um, and I actually told them no at first because I couldn't quite picture how it would work in there. Yeah. Um, and but then I gave it some more thought and we knew we wanted to keep growing. Um, and uh, we went through it some a business partner change at the end of 2017 which was a lot of the stress was caused from that yeah. and um but thankfully found an, another gentleman who's still my partner today um to fill in and um so it's just dealing with the actual business dealing with the finances behind the business um and thinking about what it looks like to grow it um all simultaneous was just a lot and it's i mean not that any, any of that has really changed but i've gotten more used to it and um and but yeah, I was just driving home from Texas with my wife and she actually drove down. So we drove back together and um, just thinking about what the show could look like in a stadium. And, uh, and yeah, we decided to give it a shot with the Mariners. Um, and then we also moved the Texas show into the stadium too, because um, we just thought there were some neat benefits with uh, like washrooms being there and just the infrastructure of a stadium. And um 
and the Seattle show ended up going like incredibly well. Like it was yeah. the biggest attendance we've ever had. And um, working with the Mariners was, was really fun. And, um, and so, yeah, that was 2018 doing two cities hosting like close to 500,000 people. And, um, and even just running, that was the first time, like me not being totally on the ground. Like I was right. in Seattle a lot more than I was in, in Dallas. And we kept the Dallas team that we had in place and, um, like not didn't go perfectly, but it, like learned a lot from that process. Yeah. And, um, and, and so because I was able to learn all that in 2018, like thinking ahead to 2019, it was like, okay, if we're going to do this properly, like we have to hire way more people. Like we were still just a handful of people out of my basement at that point. And, yeah. um, and so I actually got in touch with a, um, a CFO, uh, a retired CFO um, who ran a, like a massive company in Vancouver. Um, he was just happened to know my mom. I told my mom I was looking for a new accountant and yeah. uh, she's like, I think I know a guy and it turns <laughs> out to be like a very, very senior business guy in Vancouver. Yeah. And uh, the timing on it was just perfect. Like he had retired recently, didn't really have a ton to do. And uh, I explained to him what I was trying to do. And um, he was pretty reluctant at first, but then I guess I grew on him and uh, um, he's like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I have to actually roll up my sleeves and, and like really get into this. Yeah. And I was like, I'm like, Hey, if you're willing, I'd take it. And uh, before you know it, he was like helping us do our whole business model. And, um, and we had made like a really good margin in 2018. And so yeah. he had that to work with and, and then he really just multiplied it out and, and showed me like, just gave me the confidence of like, yeah, you can hire people, like you can afford this and, um, and just like monthly or whole season of, or sorry, a whole year of cash flow, um, And uh, uh, we ended up getting another partner at that point who was able to give us a more sizable line of credit um, so that we could uh, continue to buy lights and, and cover the GNA of the business. Cause like we're only making money for six weeks at the end of the year. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's a massive amount of investment to get us to September, October, when we start yeah. selling tickets. Um, but he just, yeah, like just with his business acumen um, and writing that model with me, like it was uh, just a really amazing process and gave me a lot of confidence to keep going and yeah. um, start hiring. And so by the end of 2019, we had 40 people. Um, we had hired a couple of executives from like, uh, from a couple of large companies in Vancouver. And, um, and so we were starting to get their eyes on things and it was just a pretty amazing process watching a team come together. And, um, we had, I think eight at the beginning and by, and by the end of the year we had 40. So, um, so, so let's, let's highlight and dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So one thing that I want to just kind of talk about is with a big enough, why, how does it matter? Right. Like how is figure outable, but with a big enough why, how does it matter? So for you, you know, as you were focused on getting these shows going or man, I, I don't know what it would look like in a stadium, but I, I think I, I do want to try that, you know, talk about that for you and how that's, you know, benefited the business up to this point. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess it's just the ability to, see an opportunity and try to visualize it yeah. and and i'm able to visualize like an end product and then it's like working backwards of of how you get there and um yeah. and and just willing to push forward without all the answers um and so i think that's that entrepreneurial bug that some people have and um and i think it's like a <laughs> it's probably a blessing and a curse um because it can get you in some bad situations sometimes um but we've been yeah we've been able to manage the business in such a way that it's led to really good things and um and and just finding the right people at the right time like um like in the early days i was doing a lot of a lot of the <laughs> the roles in the business and um like even like working with architects and designing the site plans and working with these being an art director for 3d designers on trees and reindeer and like all stuff I have no idea never done before but you just you just I don't know I just have a I like 
things to look a certain way. And, right. and so I would just push them in that direction. And, um, and, um, yeah, like just finding, like, I remember hiring Jared, um, who was our first like in-house designer. Yeah. And, um, at the time I, who I hired as a GM and, um, and he, I remember being on the phone with Jared and we got him through a referral through a Christmas site client. And of course, like all of our stuff links back to Christmas site clients. It's yeah. An amazing Rolodex. Um, and he was choosing between us and another job. And he called me up and he said, Hey man, I'm sorry. Like I'm going to go with this other role. And I just like went into 10 minutes of sales mode and <laughs> <laughs> convinced him to join us. And I remember hanging up the phone afterwards and Jordan was like, wow, like that was, that was good. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And he's been with us ever since he's a huge part of the team. And uh, um, so there's a bunch of funny stories like that. I would spend hours on LinkedIn. Like I would just live on LinkedIn looking for people and, um, and just building all these teams that are, we're all brand new. And, and also, and to knowing that we want to do it in house, we want to yeah. like really own the product. Um, in the early years, we had to use a couple of producers and stuff, and it just was never the, never exactly what I wanted. And yep. um, and but now we're, yeah, I mean, up to ninety ish people, and there's just some serious rock stars on the team. You bet. So we're, we're progressing, right? So you said, hey, we, we did uh, Dallas, then we did Seattle, then we get the Washington Nationals on, we get the Rays yeah. on. That and, was a cool year. Yeah. So it, it keeps expanding. It keeps growing, right? Word of mouth is impactful and you're getting calls from prestigious organizations to come work with. Yeah. Within each of those shows, and I don't know if this is a secret or not, but do you do the same show at each spot, but just switch it to fit the uh, design or the layout that you have, or is it a different one at each geographic location? Um, so yeah, in 2018, we did launch our second story. Okay. So um, we brought the great search, which is the original story of Santa losing his nine reindeer in a storm yeah. and people going in the maze to find all of nine reindeer. Um, the second story was um, is called The Mischievous Elf. And it's about eight toys that this uh, character Eddie has hidden, um, Eddie the Elf. And um, so that's the second story. So we launched that in Dallas in 2018. Um, and then in 2019, I think we did two great searches and one uh, mischievous elf story. Um, and the whole goal behind that is to rotate the cities between the stories. So every yeah. year they're getting a new experience. Um, and yeah, so the managers spoke super well of us um, after the 20. Uh, 18 ex yeah 2018 experience and um and that's when we got phone calls from the rays and the nationals um like the rays heard about us in an article and the guy just literally cold called our or cold emailed our website um and uh, the right. nationals i think yeah they just heard about us through the mariners and called us up and yeah. the nationals was pretty neat like that was like we were so used to going to venues and pitching this concept Yep. And suddenly we went there and they like rolled out the red carpet for us. And they were pitching us <laughs> on like yeah. why they're the best city and why they're the best team. And um, it was incredible. Like they, we showed up there. It was like this Christmas catered meal. And um, they had like this whole uh, dance routine. Like it was, our name was up on the big screen. Like it was, it was like, we, it was crazy. So it was a pretty cool experience having that table turn. And Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, thank you to the Nationals. Nationals, we're giving yes. you a shout out. That's great. Yeah. Keep treating our man, <laughs> Kevin, well. So as, as it's growing, 2019 is growing. So instantly your head goes to, well, gosh, 2020, I'm sure it's bigger. It's going to be better. And then we have this thing called the pandemic hit. So talk about, you know, that hitting in March, but your business isn't until what November, December. So talk about how you navigated that year and kind of ultimately what you end up deciding to do. Yeah. Yeah. 2020, that was a year. Um, <laughs> so 2019, we had, we were just on cloud nine. Like we had hosted what? a million people for the first time. Wow. Um, we had the best reviews that we've ever had. We had this amazing team of 40 ish people that had come together. Um, like it just by all accounts, like it was just an amazing year. And um, we're like hundred percent, like we're doing six cities next year. Like we can double up and um and we have to make all those decisions. Like, like we wish we could make them a year, two years out, but we have to know how the year prior goes. Yeah. And so we really can't make the decisions until January, February. 
and after the dust settles and um and so we were just it was like literally driving as fast as you possibly can like we were um building this people plan to take us from and we were trying to build multiple years out at the at at that point because we were like finally getting stabilized and um so we were looking at growing from 40 up to 120 people and um and we just started hiring like crazy and we already had the venues lined up um so we had the six cities locked in we knew where we wanted to take the team um uh, we were working on the financing side with the banks and we're feeling really confident that, that was all going to come together um and yeah so it got into march and suddenly we start hearing about this thing and um my brother has a company with a couple hundred employees as well and so we were like talking about it like are we shutting our offices down like yeah and we were pretty quick to to do that like like very early days um and and just yeah i just remember every week felt like a a year or something like it just time was moving very slowly and um it just becoming more and more obvious that like, hey this is this is a thing and um and so we had we ended up like it was common at that time for everyone to be furloughing and um and so we ended up furloughing uh, 40 people um which is basically everyone we had just hired for right. the ramp up and um so that was a super frustrating experience because like it was just like all this excitement and suddenly it was like tearing it all down right. and um and so it was while trying to stay optimistic keeping the people that you do have the morale up and excitement yeah. there and um so we kind of ended up waste not wasting but it wasn't really our fault but like the first six months of the year we didn't really know what to do and <laughs> right. um, and by like april is when we usually place our final orders and so everyone was like racing to april to like okay that's um like we have to get everything ready by then so everyone was kind of focused on that and then like the day that our orders were due was the day i pulled the plug on all of our shows for that year and um it was obviously a super hard decision um and at the same time there was like a little bit of a relief there because finally we're like okay we're just not doing it because like right. before it was like we're on, we're off, we're on, we're off, like flip-flopping back and forth. And it was just like super stressful and difficult to lead people without a clear right. vision. And, um, and so we were like, Hey, how are we going to make money this year? And, um, we ended up coming up with this concept called Santa calls. And, um, it was this idea that parents could call their, uh, children as Santa. And so it would change your face, change your voice. Um, and, uh, like it, Felt like a great idea so the marketing team got started on all of the uh, branding and the marketing campaigns that would go along with that the tech team got started on um the actual creation of this app and a very tight timeline and um and so i mean we sort of semi-launched it like it, the voice portion didn't work and neither did the screen recording um and the screen recording was like the whole point of the app so you could share that it was like the whole marketing plan um that user generated content and yeah. um and so it didn't end up working but it was it gave us all something to focus on yeah. and and then the design team were all focusing on the show itself and like working on our branding working on the, the shows and like coming up with new product ideas um and so looking back on it it was there's a lot of blessings that year yeah. um, like the shows are better for it and we were able to um like our chief creative officer cosmo was able to work on a bunch of um like foundational uh, lore for our our storytelling and like where you can chance not just a name it's a place and yeah. like building this whole framework behind it and um so there's a lot more depth to the brand now and yeah. uh, that's going to pay off for forever and awesome. um yeah so it's um so i remember like uh, on the finance side of all that um which we haven't i kind of hate a lot of this from the team um because i just didn't want to cause worry but um, like we had 40 employees and, um, I didn't want to cut any salaries cause it just didn't kind of feel right. Cause I wasn't asking anyone to work less. I just, if anything, people working harder yeah. and, um, and, uh, we had three partners at the time and one of the partners, um, didn't, uh, he thought we should just let everybody go. And mm. he was like, you just hang out. We'll wait this thing through and we'll rebuild when it's time and i just like vehemently disagreed with that concept yeah. and 
Um, like this guy had never even been to the show before. He had no idea what went into what we do. And um, like, if you get rid of these 40 people, like, like it's going to take years to rebuild this. Like, right. it, um, and you're definitely not going to start off the gates with three again. Like mm. you're going to start with one and it's going to be painful. Um, and uh, so we had actually had to have him leave uh, the business and, um, and the other partner um, and I've have stuck through and, um, and, but it was like pretty hairy, like down at the, like the end of the year, it was like, yep. like there's no more cash in the bank. And, um, and we actually ended up leasing a bunch of product, um, from our inventories from the shows, mm-hmm. um, cause some like, uh, there was a couple of events that did take place on the East coast. And so we leased them some product and that gave us uh, like a little bit of a couple of months of life. And, um, and then, uh, we were working on like different financing deals, talking to investors, looking at debt, like all these different options, but we were just asking people to get involved in such a unknown right situation. Like, yep. and we needed a lot of money. Like it was like, <laughs> we need $10 million and um, you may lose it all. Like <laughs> <laughs> just what everyone wants to hear. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It wasn't the easiest sale. And, yeah. uh, and even with that, we still had a few guys who, took a deep look at us and, um, and we were pretty close to closing a couple of those deals. And, um, but it was all of a sudden you don't own the comp- as much of the company anymore. And like, it's, it's not a good situation to try to raise money in. Yep. And, um, and then we ended up getting a bunch of orders like early in the year that gave us some unexpected cash flow on the retail side. Yep. Um, and so that was just like all these little miracles that kept everything alive and moving. And, like meanwhile, the team's just working, and I'm trying to hide this from as many people as I can. Not in like a bad way, but just right. like just don't get distracted kind of way. Yep. And um, and like the leadership who needed to know, they knew, and um, and yeah, it was just like we ended up surviving all the way to the end of summer, um, on our own two feet, um, just with those sales and and wrapping up for four shows and placing the product orders and. Um, and we ended up getting a little bit of debt from the bank last minute, um, which bridged us for the last couple of months that we needed. So, um, we actually ended up surviving this whole COVID situation without any, um, getting away any equity, which was, um, yes. just crazy and a blessing. And I'm grateful for, um, and, uh, and then, yeah, this season's going well so far. So we're, okay. yeah. And where are you all this year? Um, so we, are in Las Vegas, um, at Las Vegas ballpark. Um, we're in Dallas at Fair Park, uh, and then we're back with the Nationals and the Rays in their MLB stadiums. Love it, I yeah. love it. And it, it, as we're recording this, uh, it, so it'll be a little bit late when you listen to this. But as we're recording it, we just had the best weekend in yeah. Enchant history. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah, we hosted fifty-seven thousand people on Saturday like our four cities so um and like really good feedback from the guests um like huge shout out to our teams in each location who are are making that happen on the ground um in tampa at the tropicana field um uh, the first year that we were there they um it's a white ceiling if you're familiar with the venue yeah. and i didn't think about it when we were moving in there but we turned on all the lights um and it just was super bright inside <laughs> right <laughs> and i was like dang it like it's just the whole atmosphere was kind of not there and um and so we had to we went through that whole year just no choice at that point um but i was like i really don't want to go back there if we have to do that again and because it's just not the brand's level that i want yeah. and um i was like unless we can black out this stadium somehow uh-huh. like it's not going to happen and um and so i was like what if we just build a huge curtain and raise it up in the rafters and, and blocked it out and we were told no like quite a few times um from a lot of different people including our own team members and i was like no we can do this and um but it, and it ended up working out so we've created yeah. a four hundred and fifty thousand square foot curtain wow. um, and it looks amazing in there it turned out way better than even i imagined and um and it's allowed us to open up during the day yeah. so it's like an, another hundred thousand tickets of inventory um and uh, so that's been really cool like that's like helped us hit those numbers on saturday because we're yeah. selling out during the day and our normal nighttime hours um 
So it turned out really well. That's amazing. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you for being on today and just highlighting your story. I mean, who knew in the moment, you know, two <laughs> young or I guess older teenage uh, guys say, hey, maybe we'll start hanging Christmas lights that that would turn into, you know, being in huge venues and putting on amazing shows. Uh, I'm excited to continue to follow your story and see all the amazing things you do. You just got to promise me, you know, three, four years from now, when you're in every MLB stadium in one year that, uh, that you'll come back <laughs> on the show and we'll talk about the, the moments that led to that. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome, brother. Well, Hey, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks, Phil.